the president of Fiki, Shri Rashisha, the incoming president, Shri Somani, Sangeeta Reddy, Mr. Chenoy, the past presidents present here, YK Modi, Josna Suri, Vikramjit Sani, and also Harshpati Singhani. Please, are all included because if I am not mentioning any name. Members of the National Executive and AGM of Fiki, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hap happy to be here in your midst today. But for one year, that was last year, I don't know whether it was design or default, there was nothing at my end. I have been coming here for almost 10 years or more, engaging with you on matters of shared interest and concern. We have always been of one considered view that irrespective of what happens, it is our country when it comes to opportunities or accessing those opportunities, the challenges that we confront, we as a country must have the ability and the wisdom to do so together as a united India, not a country which is bruised by partisan politics, not a society which is divided by hatred, intolerance, violence and mob lynchings. The latter part has hurt India deeply, its image, its own self-confidence. There are many disturbing images that have flashed in recent years out of India, which do not belong to India, to our culture, to our philosophy, to the land of Lord Buddha, Mahatma Gandhi, or Swami Vivekananda. None of them would have ever approved of what has been said and what has happened. And that's something the time has come to pause and reflect for us as a nation and a society. I was talking to a host, Shri Shah, and others. There is good, you are talking about building a new India. What is this concept of a new India? Where does this originate from? I must say that mere words or rhetorics do not make a nation. Last five years, four and a half years, we have been satiated, overfed words. Stand up India, start up India, make in India, great India, move India, new India. This is a long list. Does that change India? And what kind of change? That's the fundamental question. We are a civilizational country. There have been ruptures in our history because of alien rules and colonization. Irrespective of that, and despite the partition of 1947, which was imposed on our country, not our own choice, but it was unavoidable by the colonial rulers through an act of parliament that was passed, not by the Indian National Congress or the All India Congress Committee session, but by the House of Commons, the Union of India Act, which partitioned India. But India emerged, though hurt, bruised, partitioned, thanks to the vision of the leaders. In particular, after the assassination of the father of the nation or the Mahanayak, of India's national struggle. His close comrades and lieutenants, Jawaharlal Nehru and 
Sardar Vallabhai Patel, both of them, and others. Let's not forget the list is a long one from Rajendra Prasad to Maulana Azad to Lal Bahadur Shastri and Pandit Gopin Pallabhant and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. These were the leaders who after Mahatma's death and in particular the first two I mentioned, the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, who stabilized the country. Why I am referring to that? Because we have to our surprise, and many of us who are keen students of history, to our shock, been told where Sardar Vallabhai Patel belonged to. And the castigation, the insults heaped continuously on one of the greatest Indians of all times respected globally, Jawaharlal Nehru, who spent the longest time in British prison. Except for those who went to gallows, he spent almost 14 years. He was the one who, when you look at what India is, and two of the greatest, I'll say, masterpieces of literature and history, which were written, the glimpses of world history and the autobiography. Both were written in prison. And the last one, when Congress was banned, Perhaps many people have forgotten. The Congress party also was banned. It was declared illegal. All the leaders were in prison for three years. And that was written on rationed prison paper without any access to any library. There is no cut, no blemish. The manuscript is preserved. If we don't bring about the change, the manuscript may be burnt by those who are custodians today. Because they want to change India. For that they have to burn that, those chapters of history of our country. I am deliberately referring to it. That India has been respected globally for what we are. A beautiful bouquet is the diversity of this country. Let's not forget that India is multi-religious and multilingual. India cannot accept and India will not be great nor advance if there is imposed uniformity. Particularly for sons and daughters, those who have aspirations and young people are aspirational, those who want to connect with the globe, with the world, if there is an imposition as to what they should wear and what they should eat and how they should behave and how they should talk, that is not the new India, I am sure we won't. Your perception of new India would be different. But the change should always be for the better. Change which gives more strength to your society and to your country. Change which propels India forward. And that's where we need to reflect where we are. We remember 2014, and rightly, there was enthusiasm, there was euphoria. And nobody can deny that. That's a fact of history. There was a big change. And the Congress Party suffered its worst defeat. And the BJP, its best victory. Today, you have to question honestly whether the verdict was read correctly or overread and overinterpreted. Not by those who are present in this room, but those who thought that this is a departure. I'm afraid that was not the people's verdict. At that time also, I remember coming to Fiki the very next year and telling that yes, it's true, and the changes there in democracies, governments change and governments come and go. But at the same time, let's not forget 
that 69% of India have voted differently. We have a multi-party democracy. We don't have a presidential system. We don't elect a Trump. Or we don't have a non-elected Xi Jinping. We don't have that system. People elect members of parliament, they vote parties. Mandates are fragmented. But there was a period of great hope that there will be transformational change in India. The economy will gallop forward. Because everything was wrong with the previous government, led by Dr. Manmohan Singh. We conveniently forgot. And on our part, the greatest fault was we could not even counter the narrative built against us. The perception was that we were a corrupt government, led by a man of the integrity of Dr. Manmohan Singh. There was policy paralysis. Everybody was convinced there was policy paralysis. And our economy was stagnating. Now let's connect to what was the hope. It was a tsunami of a hope. Two crore jobs every year. Destruction of black money, not people's money. That was also a promise. There were other commitments which were made to our farmers, especially those who are fighting even today, even today, to get a respectable remunerative price for what they produce after toiling hard. They have not got it. The youth have not got their jobs. Your economy after the policy paralysis was buried on 16th of May, has not skyrocketed. Therefore, there are questions. In democracies, questions have to be asked, and those in power, those who made those promises, have to be held to account, which the people of this great country shall do. We are in a different role today. So in opposition, we have a right to voice the concerns of the society and the people and to question the government of the day like we were when we were in office. Where is our economy today? I know that the finance minister came yesterday. He did his job like every year. And the future ministers will do their job like the same way. But the point is, we are never tired of hearing that we are the fastest growing economy on this planet. Fine, it's good. No Indian would wish India not to grow. If any Indian thinks that India should not grow faster than that person, whoever he or she may be, has no right to any position or to command the respect of our society. Our country must grow. This country is a great country. It has enormous potential. We have human resources. We have great institution builders. The whether we have grown to our right potential, if not, why? That would be a moot question. My concerns would be a growth which has not seen employment or job creation. So we are a country of 1.3 billion people with 65 million Indians being young. So we always talk of a demographic dividend. Many years ago, some of the friends may be here in Davos, I had said in a different context that we are conscious that if we do not create opportunities and enable and empower the youth to access those opportunities in our economy, this dividend, demographic dividend, may become a whirlwind. You will not be able to contain it. The governments cannot create jobs. 
you can enable a cl climate or nurture an ecosystem which helps in creating those jobs, for which what is absolutely an essential is investment in education, training in skills. For a country like India, a leap in manufacturing. Because the services sector have their limitations. I have always been of this view that irrespective of whoever may say what, developing and assimilation of high-end technologies in manufacturing and taking the manufacturing to where we wanted in our objective, adding 10 percentage points from 16 percent of GDP to 26 percent of GDP is the right answer for India. Because the services sector, as you leaders of industry know better than me, services will ride on top of the manufacturing strength, not otherwise. Most of the services, except for the IT section. But now, we have allowed a situation to develop where rhetoric clouded the reality. There was no economic crisis of 2008. There was no financial crisis of 2009. There were no successive droughts which Dr. Manmohan Singh's government faced. Where we are, by fudging numbers, you know, normally if you cheat in a school, you can be disqualified. Parents are called. Punishment is there. Isn't it? Copying, cheating is not accepted. Can it be accepted as a country? Your entire national data has been fudged. You all know, we all know, the world knows. The world knows that I have failed and I threatened the teacher, hey, give me 10 extra marks, bacha pass hona chahiye. This is what India has seen. And we have insulted the credibility of the institution of the Statistical Commission of India, the chief statistical officers of India since 1950s have been globally respected. Look at the names, they have been legends. Even today when you talk of TCA Anant or Pranab Sen, these are not the people who belong to a political party. They are great minds of India. They gave you your national data. Nobody, no government, let alone a mutilated successor body of the planning commission, which had a plan, which had a purpose, has any right to destroy the credibility of Indian statistics and Indian data. But that has happened. So the world is confused that was India lying between 2004 and 2014? And now another, the cat is out of the bag. That three years ago, the real data of the back series data was available. And the Niti Aayog, I know many of them have worked with me. I'm not finding fault with individuals. If they, but if the individuals lose their intellectual morality, then the respect is gone. That they were not willing to accept. I am willing to accept whatever has been achieved here. I am not going to dispute because these are not individual achievements. It was not Dr. Manmohan Singh's achievement. Or for five years when I was the minister, or for five years when Kamal Nath was the minister for economy. These are not individual, these are institutional, these are national achievements. That's where we were. So average was 7.8% by the old series of your GDP growth. And the back series of UPA 1 and 2, as calculated earlier, three months before, was 8.12%. 8.87 and 8.39, 8.12 is the average. 7.3 is now. So by... Just saying that, no, 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 you, you can just trash that India didn't grow in those 10 years. That's not going to change the narrative. 
Why I'm saying it? As I said, that the concern is jobless growth. Concern is lack of investment. Let's not be carried away by the FDI figures. These are not FDI. The FDI definition stands changed. When I was looking after my responsibilities as the Minister for Commerce and Industry, I had a big fight with the Finance Ministry. But for five years, I dug in my heels and never accepted to change the definition of FDI by including foreign portfolio investments and FII in the definition of the FDI for the country. Because I have been clear then and I'm clear now, it has to be tangible investment which creates, leads to capital formation, more factories are opened, jobs are created. I'm not interested in counting that money which goes out at the press of the button as it has happened since the beginning of this year. $33 billion have gone out. It's a fact. So $33 billion, maybe 33 is a small number. But $33 billion is close to 3 lakh crores. That's the flight of capital. Now, how would you rate an economy which is growing good? That an economy which attracts investment, investment has fallen by 7 percentage points, which is not a healthy thing. Private sector does not have that much of money to invest. Banks do not have money to lend. Now the government will change it and create a great new India by poaching on the contingency reserves of the country, that is with the Reserve Bank of India. That's, that's what the threat is today. So if investments are not taking place, gross capital formation is in the negative. Existing capacity utilization of the Indian industry was down to by one third and still it is down by 24% as I'm speaking to you. That's the non-utilization of the capacities that were created. Exports. There's not been a global glut. Why we are not exporting? If you look at the numbers from 2004 to 2014, from close to $80 billion in 2004 May, when Bajpayee demitted office, and $167 billion in 2009, that was a difficult year because of the global decline. We left the Indian exports only, merchandise exports, at $323 billion. Now, this year, after five years of the great growth, we are crawling to where we left. Yesterday was $26.5 billion. So we are almost crawling. And I'll, if that is to be celebrated, that we have finally reached and left for you what we inherited, I'm sorry. It should have been 500 billion plus, if not 550. You are growing, growing at an average rate of 16 percent. So, if all these, all the four engines, like of an aircraft, of the economy, investment, capital formation, job creation, and exports are down, how is that flying over continents? That's a question. The numbers don't lie. Final number cannot be fudged. So we had an economy which quadrupled in one decade. Can anybody doubt that or question that? It's a policy paralysis period. Corruption. It was 480 billion, close to that, in May 2004, when the much maligned great Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh left office, we were plus two trillion dollars. Now with all the magic, all the rhetoric, at least it should have doubled in five years. I'm not saying quadruple, we took ten years to quadruple. Have we doubled it? The answer is no. So, 
there is a difference between fact and fiction. Propaganda is there. And that propaganda is unmatched. You will see more of it. I know finance minister said there will be a lot of rhetoric. From where is it coming? We don't have the money for that rhetoric. You have seen what the electronic media, who controls it? Who controls most of the media? Never before we have seen this kind of money to build personality cults or to have a propaganda blitzkrieg? Have you ever heard that in a country which is developing where farmers are committing suicide, long marches of farmers, large number of unemployed people, a lot of people having suffered, that you have a political party which spends 4,297 crores on advertisements, beating Netflix, Amazon and Unilever put together. Wow! Which money? Whose money? Black money is eliminated. Where did it go? These are questions which we need to ask. And next two months, 4,000 crores have been sanctioned by the cabinet. 2,000 crores for January, 2,000 crores for February of the great achievements. So what the poor people are confused. That what is the reality? So we, uh, when I stand here, embracing myself to face that situation, that how will we cope with that kind of assault of resources and propaganda? We don't get, anchors have become propagandists today, most of them. I have no hesitation. I'm sure some cameras are there, you can report. I say it. What will happen to our democracy? The mass media, ever since the 1960s in America, if you go by the various commission reports, it was made clear about the social commitment and responsibility of the mass media. You have to have free media, but the free media must also be fair. But if you control everything, how does the, do the people know what is the truth? So that's what we are seeking to convey. What we have in mind is to try and find a way forward in a democracy because things don't remain frozen. It was said when I was asked to speak that, well, there have been elections. India always sees elections. We are grateful to the people. We will not say it is us, it is them. Whether in Rajasthan, the numbers may look close, but the real numbers are different. I was explaining to some of your colleagues. Or in Madhya Pradesh or in Chhattisgarh. The most erudite party leader ever produced in India, Mr. Amit Shah, has been never tired of telling the country what the map of India is and where the Congress was confined. I want to, you to invite him so that I can ask him what is the map of India. Neither he can change nor I can change. That will remain the same. But in democracies, the colors will keep on changing. They'll never remain frozen. That's what democracy is about. If that is frozen, then there is no democracy. Then there is no voice. Then the vote is meaningless. And that's what is happening in India. This is a big challenge. I personally am of this view that we need to restore an environment where bitterness, abuse and vitriol is removed. I am not the one who will ever say that those presently in office did not intend to 
do something good. But at the same time, I'm not willing to accept that all those who built India had to be disparaged for us to believe that the journey of this country started on 16th May 2014, not 15th of August 1947. I'm afraid, respectfully, I'll differ from the words which I have heard a lot that in fact is full of ignorance and arrogance. This combination is a lethal one. Arrogance itself is dangerous. If you add to it ignorance of history, a lack of respect for your civilization, for your achievements, then the end result can be very bad. And lastly, let me tell you, some of you may have forgotten, but the people of India were really hurt. And now we have discovered, traveling across the country, the hurt of demonetization is there in rural India, with the farmers, with the workers, with the housewives. They lost everything. Then overnight, those who were going to clean the black money, insulting people's money as black money, 5,000 rupees and 1,000 rupees, 500 and 1,000 rupees. 86% of the nation's currency was invalidated. We had said then, we say it now, the Reserve Bank has spoken. It's a different matter that every institution is under assault and the great India has seen departure of two Reserve Bank governors. Which institution is left intact today? I want to ask this question. See, in a constitutional democracy, what we invest in are institutions. Individuals are immaterial. Prime Ministers come and go. Nobody is immortal. No government remains in office forever. But the institutions that serve the country, that serve our democracy, must be left intact. And that's my biggest concern today with the present rulers, that they are destroying our institutions, whether it's the Reserve Bank, the CBI, the ED. You name one institution. India cannot become a new India or a great India if it destroys what it has built after its independence. I'll not say much. I've said enough. I would like to thank you once again. Thank you.